All right, we're ready to start this morning and uh, this uh, cloudy resurrection morning, resurrection day morning, and welcome you, those that have not been with uh, my, my teaching on Sunday mornings, I, I welcome you today too. And um, I'll give a bit of an overview, but I always like to start our time and finish our time with a word of prayer, so we'll do that now. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what this day means in, uh, in your story, in the history of your word, and the, the history of what this day is to us, that first day of the week after Jesus went to the cross and died and was in the grave for three days and three nights and then rose from the dead and, uh, and the women came to the tomb uh, to re-anoint him, his body, and he wasn't there. So we thank you, Lord, for what this day means to us as those who put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We know that we have the promise, too, of rising from the dead when Jesus comes back and he calls us up and calls us out of the grave. And so we, too, will receive a glorified body, a renewed body. Your word says, like the body of Jesus rising from the dead. And so we look forward to that time, each of us, in our, in our personal journeys and that time in your agenda, your age, when that all is going to come about. So we ask you now, Lord, as we gather together in this time of study, looking in an overview of the ages, of the ages past, but we know that that crossroads point in your plan was when Jesus died on the cross, the cross itself, and then came out of the grave. And we now know that he's alive. He's not in the tomb. And so we thank you for that. And we thank you for your continuing plan. And we thank you for the rest of your plan that takes us to the end of this age and into the kingdom. And so we look forward to the future. And we, we study your word to better understand it. So I thank you for your guidance of your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who you have given to each one of us by faith in Jesus Christ. And we have the teacher within us through the Holy Spirit. So help us to use the teacher uh, regularly to grow in our understanding and knowledge of your word. We thank you for this time and all the people that have gathered and come here this morning and enjoyed the, 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 breakfast, the breakfast that was served. And, and we thank you for that fellowship and the, and the food. But we now we thank you for the food from your word. And so we ask that the Holy Spirit feed us in this time of study and in our time of worship this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to start because this is a special day on our church calendar. And it's what we prefer to call Resurrection Day, commonly known as Easter. But I, I truly believe in my study of the background of that term. It's a, it's a pagan term. It comes from the goddess Ishtar. And Ishtar is not Easter. Easter was a Babylonian goddess. And so in the pagan world, uh, Easter beca uh, became a, an offshoot of that name, I believe. So, so we kind of prefer, I prefer, to call it Resurrection Day. And uh, I don't even use, generally in my own thinking, don't even use the term Sunday, even though, though it is that day of the week. But the days of the week are also pagan in nature as well. I don't know if you know that too. So, Anyway, this is Resurrection Day. And so I, I drew this little thing today just for this day as I lead into my study that I'm been, uh, I guess this is now what the 18th, 18th lesson that I've taught on this study. And, we, and we're on the second lesson and we have seven total lessons. So I kind of figured if we keep going at the rate we're going, it'll probably, probably be a year and a half before I finish it, which is half of the time that I spent on Isaiah. So anyway, um, but I wanted to share this little message here 
to lead into this teaching because today we do celebrate. We celebrate in, in the cross, if you really look at the cross, um, is in effect a timing on God's agenda, God's divine agenda, when his own son would go to the cross at a time in history that I refer to as the crossroads of God's divine agenda. And so, if we just stopped at the cross, and that's that Jesus died for our sins, but he didn't come out of the grave, he'd just be a dead savior. Mm -hmm. And so, we have a resurrected savior. We have one who's alive. He's not in the grave. He's, the tomb is empty. He's out of the grave. And so, this on my teaching will come in the fifth lesson. Because the fifth lesson, I, I didn't give those that haven't been here before, uh, the ages, the, the seven ages. So if you're interested, I can, I can get copies of it for you after class or today before church is over or whatever. Um, I have seven lessons, seven ages of, in God's divine plan. We've covered to this point in the 18 weeks that we've uh, been teaching on this, Nine weeks, we covered the age of innocence, which is from creation to the fall. And then the one we're on today, the, the handout you have, the outline you should have, is, is the age of conscience is our guide. So the age of conscience is where we're at. We're finishing it up, hopefully today, and be able to move on to the next one next week, which is human government established. And so these all fall, fall in pattern. I'll talk about this in a little bit, but I put this on the, on the poster board for the first time this, this week. So I give you a little bit of a likely, emphasize the term likely dating of these ages. Uh, I follow a lot of Bishop Usher's dating, I believe in about the 1600s, I think is when he lived. Um, he meticulously went through the Old Testament, the genealogies, and everything else, and I agree with him on most, well, almost everything. And so he dates, according to the genealogies of the Old Testament, creation. The creation of Adam was in 4004 B.C. Now, of course, the secular world will argue, argue that this is millions or billions of years old. Well, we know, for one thing, that's partially true, because God has always existed. We don't know how many total years that was. <laughs> it's infinite. It's basically infinite, into the past and into the future. But he started his divine agenda, as I see it, and biblically we have it, uh, I believe, when he created man. <clears throat> because when he chose of his own will and his own way that he wanted to create a being that would love him like he loves them and would serve him like he wants us to serve. The angels were not enough. That's how I see it. He had created the angels in, in what I call uh, uh, the ages past. And we know what happened to one of those angels. One of those angels rebelled against God. We usually call him Lucifer or the devil or Satan. And he had to be cast out. But they were the attendants of God in the heavenly realm for, for years. So. <clears throat> but anyway, the age we're talking about today with the resurrection of Jesus is the fifth age on my list of teachings that I call the conclusion to buy the law. Because there was an age in which God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, and the people of Israel said, yes, we will follow you. And they couldn't even wait till he came down the mountain. Moses came down the mountain to rebel against God. But the law was given, and we know that one of the things that Jesus accomplished when he came here was to go to the cross but he perfectly kept the law. He kept the law perfectly. He's the only one that could do that. I don't think anybody here would raise their hand that they've perfectly kept the law. 
I would say <laughs> that's uh, virtually impossible for sinful human beings. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying and do it to the best that we can. So, so anyway, these ages have gone through and we're at the conclusion of the second age, which is following the flood. And, uh, and I will pick up just on the reading in chapter 9 of Genesis, just to kind of uh, conclude the reading for this second lesson, the age of conscience. And then, like I say, next week, we'll, we'll attempt to move on to Genesis 10 to 12, which includes the period of time of the table of nations. Where did the descendants of Noah all settle? And... Uh, and then we know there was one major event in that period of time, or, or two actually, but the one, the first one, was the Tower of Babel. So we'll be talking about the Tower of Babel and this te that teaching. And then we'll talk about, because the age will uh, not really end, the age of human government has not ended. But that period of time was the beginning of the development of governance. So one of the things we'll be talking about in that uh, that third lesson, the different forms of governance. And I'm doing a little study on it myself. You, you could probably name some right off the top of your head because it's so prominent even in our country today. The, the, the people that really don't like the, the Democratic Republic style of government, constitutional democratic style of government are trying to change it. And you can see all the efforts of doing that. They would rather have socialism. And socialism is a form of government, and it's been tried many, many times in different ways. Sometimes it ends up being communism. Sometimes it ends up being totalitarianism. We see some of the results of it with the war in the Ukraine right now. You know, so those, those kind of things. So, so we'll talk about <clears throat> how man is taking that principle of God wanting man to create, or God would show him the best way of governance, but we know even his chosen people, Israel, did not, they wanted to be like the world. They wanted a king for themselves. And so the kingship time frame started with their sense of rebellion against God. God wasn't enough for them. They wanted to be like the other, other uh, uh, nations of the world around them. So anyway, all that's what we're looking forward to. Let me uh, let me kind of finish up what we're doing because where we're at on the outline, for those of you who have your outline, I want to finish on the bottom of page three and it's, it's the section, it's the topic that's called post-flood world. Now last week I covered most of the bullet points there because this section, if you read it from Genesis 8, chapter 8, verse 15, all the way to 929, you'll see that the first bullet point is the all came out of the ark. So after the flood was completed, the earth dried up, uh, God said, come out. And so he encouraged Noah and his family to come out, and they came out, and the first thing they did was present uh, an altar, of an altar of sacrifice to the Lord. And many of the clean animals were killed in that sacrifice as a, as a thank you to God, a thank offering to God. And so, but then God gives his promise really to all people from that point on, but he did it through Noah. So we call it the Noahic covenant. The Noahic covenant mostly in chapter 9, but he mentioned it first in chapter 8 there, 8, 21, and 22. And then the third bullet point uh, gives us, I think it's an interesting study if you study this for yourself, where did some of the changes that happened after the flood get initiated? Like when did animals become fearful of man after the flood? When did, when did God allow men, humans, to eat meat after the flood? When did he put restrictions on eating meat that has blood in it, blood left in it? 
after the flood. And then the fourth one, which some may debate, but we know it's even in our, our day, the attitude towards capital punishment. But God instituted capital punishment. Read Genesis 9, 5 to 6. If you take the life of a man, your life is required to be taken. That's capital punishment. And so, so those things are all part of, uh, of this. And then we went on and, and talked about the covenant itself and the seven times it's mentioned in these verses. Uh, God gave it to Noah for us as a sign. So every time you see the rainbow in the sky after a rainstorm, mm -hmm. it should remind you of God's covenant through Noah to us that he will never destroy the earth by water again. That isn't saying that he isn't going to destroy it another way, because he does say by fire. And so the tribulation period seems to indicate we're moving to a point where there will be destruction upon the earth. But I personally believe that the planet earth, uh, terra firma of earth, will never it will be refurbished. It will be renewed in the eternal kingdom of Revelation 21. It will not be done away with and God recreate the whole earth. But it will be restored. So, and the rainbow is mentioned three times and the sign is mentioned three times in the, this section. So I talked about that last week. For those of you that haven't had a chance to share with us in the, in the Bible studies. If you have access to your computer, you can go to um, Redeeming Grace Bible Church Yankton and you can call it up on YouTube. And, and each of my lessons on Sunday morning are on YouTube visually, but I also we also have them on our website, um, redeeminggracebc.org. And, and those are Verp, those are on the audio recording. And there, if I hand out handouts, I usually post those handouts, or Cindy helps me with posting those handouts on the, uh, on the website. So you can have access to the handouts if you choose to want to follow, follow, continue to follow the teaching. But anyway, we're at a point today where we're ready to uh, kind of finish up that last point. God made his covenant with Noah and his sons, and I've covered most of that. But then we read last week Noah's vineyard account, verses uh, 9, 18 to 29. I didn't get into it a lot. I know Raymond, in some of his teachings, has said there's, a lot, there's more to it, possibly, than just one of the youngest boy of Noah looking on his father naked, and therefore, uh, God, in a sense, through Noah, cursed the, the youngest son of Ham. Ham would be the youngest son of Noah. And so it was, no, was Ham's youngest son, Canaan, who would receive the curse for Ham's actions. And that's where we read last week. But I'm going to re read that part again. Uh, let, me just, let me just start with... Um, well, let's just, let's just start back with um, verse 20. Verse 20 of chapter 9, and I'll read that, and then what I hadn't finished up last week is just those last couple verses, but I'll talk about it in general, and if, if Raymond wants to add anything to it, that, that, would, that would be fine. It says, Noah, a man of, of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered, in other words, naked, inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backward and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned the other way, so that they would not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Not cursed be Ham, but cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, 
will be will he be to his brothers and then he went on and said in verse 26 blessed be the lord the god of shem may the Can may canaan be the slave of shem may god extend the territory of japheth may japheth live in the tents of shem and may canaan be his slave i'm going to stop there i'll read those last two verses in a little bit so we have this peculiar situation where, okay, after the flood, doing the sacrifices and everything else, and when the time came for, for Noah to get back to work, so to speak, he planted a vineyard. So there had to take some time for that to grow and then develop fruit. So there's some, some time that occurs, you know, that happens in this time frame. But in the process, he partook of the fruit of the vine, maybe in a not so good way, because it apparently was fermented and, and he got dr drank of it and got drunk and ended up lying in, his, lying in his own tent naked. And his youngest son, Ham, looked upon him and I gather from what he said, I, I can't wait to tell my brothers, you know, just what I just saw, our dad naked in the tent. And so he was, I think, ridiculing in a sense and, and got his, his brothers uh, to look upon or try to get them to look upon it too. But they took the, uh, the right way and they wouldn't even look upon their father's nakedness and they backed into the, into the tent with this blanket and they put it over their father. And so they covered, they covered his nakedness. So... Um, and then, of course, that, that curse, the curse, fell upon Canaan. Like I said, Canaan would be the youngest son of Ham, and Ham was the youngest son of Noah. So, I mean, I, I don't know if we can get definitively about you know, why specifically God made that decision, but, you know, I don't know if Raymond wants to share anything further on the other potential images of the looking well, upon one, nakedness. One thing, one thing is interesting here that um, while Canaan is mentioned last, there's a possibility that he was the oldest one, but when you curse him, they end up last. Oh. Like Shem, there's some possibility that he was actually a younger son than Jason, Japheth, but he's mentioned first. Mm -hmm. um, and then about the concept of... of, of the father's nakedness. Leviticus says that the nakedness of the father is the wife. However, in this context, after list, uh, reading it more and studying it more, they were backing up and covering the father's nakedness. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that's exactly, yeah. they were shaming the father. So yeah. that's, that's the issue there. Yeah. Okay. No, nothing deeper than that. I don't, I don't think so. Even though there's. We'd like to make it because Leviticus has a connection, but. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll leave it at that. That's kind of how I, you know, settled in my thinking that this, to me, is the fact that they just looked, he looked upon him, and it was shameful, and, but the brothers did the right thing. And so they are then, in turn, blessed, as I just read. Shem would be blessed, and Japheth would be blessed by extending his territory. So when they, we'll see in chapter 10, at the table of nations, we'll see where the descendants of each of these sons went. And we know the critical one is, the, is, a, rel, is a descendant, a grandson of, of Ham, uh, who is known as Nimrod. And he was the son of Cush. Cush, I believe, was the oldest son of, of, Na, of Ham. And so, at least that's the sense we have as we'll read on in chapter 10. Can I make one more we, comment? Sure. When you look at verse 6, it says Ham, it says Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The first three there, Cush, Egypt, and Put, are in Africa. Yep. And Canaan shows up in on the coast of Israel. Right. But people say, the historians say that Canaan probably, because Ham moved to Africa, mm -hmm. so Canaan probably tried to take the Shemites um, land in Israel and moved up there. Uh -huh, yeah. And so they didn't start there, they moved into okay. that land. And, and that's another reason, you know, of the cursing too. Yeah. Falls in with the cursing issue. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it's a continued reason for the dispute over that land. I mean, you look at it today in the, the battle between the Palestinians or the Arabs or the, or, or the Muslims and the Jews, Israel, with, with Israel now being back in their land, God having brought them back, you know, the, the Palestinians are claiming that they had it before Israel ever had it. So that's still the ongoing dispute in the world affairs today. And it's the most treasured piece of land in all of earth. And we know the, the, the center of that is Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city of peace, the city of God. And so, and we know prophetically, and that's what we continue to study and try to understand and teach on it, you know, what, what happens from here? What are we seeing developing in our world today? And the question is, what in the world is going on today? How many of you have asked that question? <laughs> You can't help but ask it. If you watch the news at all, you watch what's going on, you watch the craziness, you watch the horrors, horrors of war, you know, in Ukraine, you watch all this stuff, you know, what, what is God's divine agenda in all this? Because God allows these things to happen for a greater purpose, to bring about his ultimate plan, which will be, and that's what we got to keep our eye on, will be the return of his son, Jesus Christ. And we believe, I believe personally, Raymond, I believe, agrees with me and, and several others, because um, it's the way we teach it here, that we believe when the time is right, Jesus is going to come back for his own, for his church, for the body of believers, those who are, have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and will be caught up to him in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And, and, and it will be at that time that we will be changed, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 51, uh, 15, 51 to 53, when in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed into our new bodies, our glorified bodies. So, so those are pictures that were given as mysteries to Paul in the New Testament times to the church things that weren't clearly known in the Old Testament. Even though the Old Testament has so much prophecy beyond where we are today, and that's why it's still worthwhile to study fervently, which I believe Raymond does as much as anybody, to study the details of that word of prophecy in the Old Testament. So, but anyway, we're, we're back in Genesis here. In the, in the formation of, of God's plan following the flood. And so uh, I would just want to share those last two verses to, to finish up the reading on this particular study because it just summarizes it, verse 28 and 29. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Now remember, he was 600 years old when the flood came. Now, people today would say, you know, how, can, how could people live to be 900 years old? And I've taught in, in, in some of the earlier uh, topics, in, well, in the Age of Innocence and so forth, the first lesson, that God said in the Garden of Eden, when you eat of this tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, in the day you do it, you will surely die. Now we know that Adam didn't immediately die, and Eve didn't immediately die when they ate of the tree, but Adam ended up living, according to the genealogy, 930 years. So it makes us think about, and I believe, that what God was saying, that if you eat of this tree, you will become knowledgeable about the essence of good versus evil. And the good versus evil uh, will be uh, will be a consequence. The evil will come as a consequence of eating this forbidden fruit, and the forbidden fruit will uh, will be taking from the from the tree that God forbid. And so we have, I believe, the thousand year period of time. That first thousand years after Adam was created. That is the one day is the day in which they will surely die. 
So not only were they spiritually dead after partaking of the forbidden fruit, but they were also going to be physically dead. They would die in that first thousand years. And if you look at the genealogy of those first ten generations, you'll see that most of them lived close to a thousand years in the, in the first ten generations. And then it changed after Noah, after the flood, somewhat. So anyway, but it says here that after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. To get all together, Noah lived 950 years, and then he died. So that extended life, I think, was able to be realized, not only because it's God's plan, but because of the atmosphere. Before the flood, as I've shared on, I believe if you read all of scripture and understand it as best you can, God created this world, this earth, with a canopy over it. And there was a canopy of protection from the sun's rays, all the things that may cause uh, consequences of health in our world today, or some of them. Um, and so I, I believe the canopy was there, and of course that canopy broke loose at the time of the flood. That's where a lot of the water came from, but they also the water came from the deep. And so the water flooded the earth to over 20 feet above the highest mountain. And the highest mountain, um, we know there was Mount Ararat at that time. We don't know about the other mountains that exist today and how, how high they, they possibly were. But anyway, um, you know, God caught, uh, the flood changed everything. I've said a few of the things that, that God purposely changed. And I believe the length of life changed, and the length of life really changed even more in the latter, the latter days. You know, Abraham lived to be 180 years old. Moses lived to be 120 years old. So there was still long lived long life, but not like it was in the first, first ages. So, so we'll get to, get to those later, but to complete this age, I just wanted to put everything in context. And I don't have a handout for this at this point in time, but you can either take a picture of it or, or write it down or whatever. This is my best analysis of the likely ages. Now generally, um, and that's what I'm doing, dividing God's total plan through the ages, from the past to the present into the future, into seven major ages, if you will. And the first one, like I said, we've gone through was creation to the fall, first three chapters of Genesis. The second age we're completing now, which is from chapter four through chapter nine. And then we'll go on with the next one in Genesis 10 to 12. And then this fourth one, we will really extensively talk about the character of Abraham. Because Abraham was one that really changed uh, the whole agenda with God because he found a man. He found a man that he would call and call and out of his descendants he would make a people, a chosen people. Israel, we know them as, and, and they would be his people. And then he gave them the law through Moses on Mount Sinai. That'll be age five. And this is what I want to bring us to now, because where are we? Where are we right now? We have all this history. We have all this history. You can read about it. You can grow to understand from creation all the way to the cross, and we're now on this side of the cross. The cross is 2,000 years ago, Jesus died. So we're in the age of what we call grace or the church. And in this age, this age will stay the age of grace or the age of the church until Jesus comes back to take his church out of here. And so the church age will be fulfilled and completed with his coming back. And I personally believe it's pre-tribulation. We can argue about it. There are different, different people who teach different things. They can believe that it's pre-wrath, rapture. 
Some don't even believe in the rapture. But I believe that there's clear images in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 13 to 18. I don't know how you can read that without not seeing the picture of the rapture. And 1 uh, Corinthians 15, 51 to 53, which talks about the instantaneous nature of it. So we're in that age. And I, so the dating of these, like I say, is likely dating. I think, because I follow Bishop Usher's uh, genealogy or aging, and he dates the time of innocence before Adam and Eve fell to being three years. Raymond and I have talked about this too. I thought it might be a little bit longer than that in my personal thinking, but then Raymond said, because of God's command, be fruitful and multiply, you would think that Adam and Eve would want to follow that command and have children, which is what they were expected to have. So it's more, I think it's quite likely, now that I've thought about it, that it was a very short period of time, that age of perfection, the age in the garden with Adam and Eve without sin. But three years, which would make it 401 BC, uh, 4001 uh, BC, then we've just gone through the, the, the second age, and I believe from, from the age of the fall, from the fall to the flood is, if you look at genealogy again, look at the timing, look at the, the age to which Noah, from when Noah was born to when the flood came, he was 600 years old, and you look at that genealogy, you'll date it to around 2348 BC, the flood came. And that, so that's another six, uh, it's uh, 1653 years from the fall. And the age of the, the third age, which we'll be going into starting hopefully next week, uh, maybe not, <laughs> uh, but I'll try to, try to get it ready next week because anyway, we need to go on. Um, but it, it's going to be the age, what I call, from the flood, the end of the flood, to the age that Abraham, Abram, was called by God. And so that's where we'll be. And then you can, you can look at the rest of it as far as dating. I date, I date the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection in 30 A.D. Raymond, sometimes in his teaching, uses 32 A.D. You know, we can't be absolutely sure, but... My question is dates. What point of event in history is A.D. and B.C.? Uh, well, it looks like, in, in my opinion, it was changed by the Romans. Pardon? It was changed by the Romans. The calendar was changed by the Romans. Okay, the okay. Romans were the, the governance of the time when Jesus was born. We know that. Yeah. And so how that was selected, I've never got to the point of being able to study and pin it down. Who, who did it? Who said now we're going to start with A.D.? Yeah, that's why I but we know if you look at timing of B.C. to A.D., there's no zero year. It goes from 1, A, 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. And so that makes it a little tricky in, 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 in time frames. But that's, but that's that's how I date it, and of course we don't know the future from this point as far as timing. So, so those are the things that I think we're at a point where we probably need to stop. Uh, we will hopefully get started on the next age agenda. It's, it's taken us about nine weeks for each, each agenda. I should be able to get through this one probably a little bit shorter in this period of time. But then there's some of the others I don't even have in my mind yet how I'm going to present them. So I, I'm not sure what the timing will be. But, but I'm shooting for trying to make this no longer than a year and a half study. And we're already 18, 18 weeks into it. So Anyway, let's uh, close in prayer, prepare ourselves for a time of worship. I thank you all for coming this morning and, and participating with us in the breakfast and now our, our time of study here and, and our time of worship. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time you've given us this day to remember this day in a way that makes it special. Special for each one of us who 
have truly put our faith and trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so that we, we can honor you by celebrating, singing, in prayer, uh, in sharing the word, in the message that will be given this day as we recall from your word what happened at that, that early first day of the week, that for early before dawn even, that the women went to the grave and the grave was open and there was an earthquake and all the things that happened uh, that's recorded in your word. So it is your story, it is your word that we look to and grow in our understanding so we have knowledge of what you've done and what you've brought us to at this point in the, in the time frame of time. You've given us time so we can keep track of things. Uh, but we also have a future. We have a future that is unknown to some degree but we can examine it, study it from your word, and we thank you for the guiding of the Holy Spirit to help us bring us to that point of the truths that are in your word that we then can share with each other. So I thank you for this time. I thank you for the people who have come. I thank you ahead of time for our time of worship, and I just ask for your continued blessing in our time of worship and the fellowship that we have with one another centered and focused on a risen Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.